Good afternoon. My name is Jim Townsend, and I am the director of the Levin Center at Wayne State University Law School. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's panel discussion entitled Portraits in Oversight, the Work of Representative Elijah Cummings. I want to thank the U.S. Capitol Historical Society for co-hosting today's panel. This discussion is the second panel we have co-hosted to highlight the Levin Center's new online program called Portraits in Oversight a series of profiles about historically significant congressional investigations and the members of Congress who led them. The portraits, which feature illuminating text and images, explore congressional oversight from 1792 to the present day, including inquiries into the Civil War, covert CIA operations, the Enron collapse and Watergate, and such figures as Representatives John Dingell and Elijah Cummings and Senators Harry Truman and Joe McCarthy. All 14 portraits can be viewed online at our website, levin-center.org, or can be downloaded and are free to use with acknowledgement. And you can return to the site to see new additions to the portrait gallery as they come online in the future. The Levin Center is especially honored to be able to bring together this distinguished group of panelists to discuss Congressman Elijah E. Cummings, the son of sharecroppers who became chair of the House Oversight Committee and throughout his career led several of the most consequential oversight investigations of the last generation. Representative Cummings' life and work epitomize what these portraits seek to convey, the impact that congressional oversight has on American history and the importance of leadership without which critical facts about our society and government would never have come to light. We come together today as part of Wayne State University's celebration of Black History Month. The historian Henry Louis Gates Jr. pointed out that America has never engaged in a truth and reconciliation process with respect to American slavery and its aftermath. But Congress, in investigating the Ku Klux Klan in the 1870s, for the first time provided a platform where at least some oppressed and terrorized black citizens had an opportunity to be heard. Congressman Elijah Cummings believed in oversight because he wanted all citizens to be heard. He dedicated a good portion of his congressional career to getting to the heart of critically important issues and giving voice to the concerns of all Americans. Now, let me say a brief word about the Levin Center for those of you not familiar with us. The Levin Center's mission is to promote and teach bipartisan fact-based oversight and civil discourse as instruments of change and as essential components of our democracy. Since 2015, when the late Carl Levin, Senator Carl Levin established the center here at Wayne State University Law School, we have pursued that mission through trainings and workshops in Congress and state legislatures convenings and commentary in the media and in the courts and through research and scholarship. You can learn more about our work by visiting our website. Again, that's levin-center.org, joining one of our listservs or following us on social media. Before turning things over to our moderator who will introduce the panel, I want to thank again the U.S. Historical Society for co-sponsoring this event and ask its president and CEO, Jane Campbell, to say a few words. Jane? Thank you so much, Jim. It is an honor indeed to co-sponsor this with the Levin Center. I had the honor to work with Senator Levin when I was the staff director for the Committee on Small Business. And we knew that when Senator Levin came in and asked questions, we were gonna get the right questions that would get the answers from the administration. And so it is indeed a proper way to honor him, to establish the center, to study congressional oversight. Um, one of the fascinating things we always do when we participate in programs as the Capitol Historical Society is look at what's the history. And Jim, you mentioned some of it, but you go back to the constitution, which doesn't specifically say the Congress shall provide oversight, but it does say that the Congress alone is authorized to appropriate funds. And flowing from that authority comes the necessity for congressional oversight. 
because how can you appropriate funds if you don't know what those funds are being used for, if you don't know the laws being followed, if you can't follow through and you look back to this matter has been litigated. Um, and in 1927, the Supreme Court found that in investigating the Department of Justice on a matter, Congress was absolutely considering what the Supreme Court called a subject on which legislation could be had, pretty wide open. And so you look back and you see that one of the first laws of the first Congress, the 1789 Act to establish the Treasury Department, called on the Secretary of the Treasury, Treasury to report to the Congress on public expenditures on all accounts. And throughout history, as Jim has enumerated, and as the portraits really enumerate, Congress has stepped in and provided that critical oversight. And it has been affirmed time and again in various congressional legislation. So what we even see is that Congress stepped far, stepped into it really clearly to say that when a president established a gag rule to prohibit people from going and talking to Congress, that that was not going to work. That in fact, we would have whistleblower protection so that there would be a constant flow of information to the Congress. Congressman Cummings is a unique figure. He's often been identified by those who worked with him as the true north of Congress. And his work in congressional oversight is marquee. And so it is an honor for the Capitol Historical Society to join with the Levin Center and this incredible group of scholars and people who knew and worked with Congressman Cummings to provide those portraits in oversight. Thank you very much, Jim, for allowing us to be part. Jane, thank you for those remarks. Now let me introduce our moderator for today's panel, Jennifer Celine. Uh, Jennifer Celine, uh, or as she's known as Jen, last month became the newest member of the Levin Center staff when she joined us as co-director of the Levin Center's Washington office. Jen came to the center from academia. She was a professor of political science at the University of Missouri, and prior to that at the University of Illinois. She has published extensively on administrative law, separation of powers issues, and oversight. Jen earned her PhD from Vanderbilt University and her JD from Wake Forest University. Please welcome my colleague, Jennifer Sleen. Jen, take it away. Thanks, Jim. Um, and thank you, Jane, for your, also, your wonderful introductory remarks. Um, as, as both Jim and Jane suggested, uh, one of my favorite profiles on oversight is on the oversight work of Representative Elijah Cummings. And it's particularly important to me as someone who grew up in Baltimore and spent the first 18 years of my life there. Uh, and my entire extended family is still in the Baltimore uh, area. And that is important for Elijah Cummings because he was elected in 1996 as a representative for Maryland's 7th Congressional District. And as was suggested, he served on the Committee of on Oversight and Reform from his earliest days in Congress, becoming ranking minority member in 2010 and committee chair in 2019. And so we put this, we put together this uh, distinguished list of panelists to discuss the late Representative Cummings' legacy of tremendous commitment to fact finding and public service more generally. And so I, what I'd like to do now is just introduce each of our panelists. First, we have Dave Rapallo, who is the current director of the Federal Legislation Clinic at Georgetown Law. He spent 23 years in high level positions in both Congress and the White House, including as staff director of the House Committee on Oversight and Reform under Chairman Cummings. Uh, next, we have Vernon Sims, who is the current director of the Smithsonian's Office of Government Relations. Uh, for more than 20 years, uh, Vernon served as Chief of Staff for Representative Cummings, and in that role, he provided strategic support of Representative Cummings' leadership on the Committee on Oversight and Reform, as well as his connections to the Black uh, Congressional Black Caucus. 
Next, we have Trudy Perkins, who is the current acting chief of staff for Senator Sherrod Brown. She served as a congressional staffer for 20 years, and prior to joining Senator Brown's office in 2020, she served as deputy chief of staff of, and communications director for Representative Cummings. And then finally, last but not least, we have uh, Larry Gibson, who is the Morton Sophia Mock Professor at the University of Maryland's Francis King Carey School of Law. And in addition to extensive research on the history of civil rights and African American lawyers in Maryland, he served as Associate Deputy Attorney General in the Carter administration and has directed local, state, and national political campaigns since 1968. And so to get things started, because each of our panelists have personal interactions with Elijah Cummings and have really known him as a human being as well as a prolific figure in oversight, I ask each of our panelists to take about five minutes or so to share one story of Representative Cummings that they feel encapsulates his commitment to oversight and fact-finding. And after each of them share their stories, uh, we'll have a fairly informal conversation and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So first we're going to start with Larry and then we will move down the list from there. So take it away, Larry. My mission is to give you a little personal background about Elijah Cummings, to explain why he was by disposition, by character and by background, a perfect match to perform meaningful congressional oversight. Elijah Cummings and I first met 53 years ago on March the 26th, 1969. Elijah was an 18 year old student at the high school I had uh, attended. The name is Baltimore City College. Uh, the uh, school had a hall of fame which honored distinguished alumni. Elijah, as the senior class president, concluded that the school should add some diversity to its Hall of Fame because no African-American had ever been inducted. They explained to Elijah that the Hall of Fame honored graduates who had distinguished themselves over long careers. The average age of the inductees was about 60 years old. But Elijah Cummings continued to press. With the persistence and their persuasiveness, we saw in later years in Congress. He argued that the selection criteria should be changed because it, would, uh, it should take into account that the school had excluded black students up until Brown versus Board of Education. Therefore, it would take decades before there were any African-American alumni in their 60s. Well, Elijah's relentless advocacy prevailed. And I became the beneficiary and was selected to the Hall of Fame. Now, I was 27 years old. And my only claim to fame was that Mayor D'Alessandro, Nancy Pelosi's brother, had appointed me to the Baltimore City School Board. I first met Elijah Cummings at the Hall of Fame induction ceremony, and we were friends from that day forward. I enjoyed watching how at every stage of his career, Elijah Cummings repeatedly rose to leadership and relentlessly fought for what was right. After high school, Elijah went to Howard University where he was elected Phi Beta Kappa and became the president of the student government and pressed the administration there on matters important to students. After Howard, Elijah attended the University of Maryland School of Law where I was teaching. He became a leader of the Black Law Students Association and was similarly uh, an advocate uh, for, uh, for various changes. Then Elijah became a leader among lawyers. 
The Black Lawyers Association in Maryland is called the Monumental City Bar Association, and it had existed since 1934. And the association's president was usually a senior member of the bar. That was until Elijah Cummings, a lawyer for just seven years, was elected president. In that position, he pressured the judges, the uh, legislators, governors to, uh, to do various things that would improve particularly uh, outcomes and uh, uh, fairness uh, to African-Americans. Then he began his career in elective office. First, there were his years in the Maryland General Assembly where he became the uh, Speaker Pro Tem. Then came his distinguished years in Congress as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus, as ranking member of the Oversight Committee, and finally its chair. At every stage, Elijah Cummins focused on helping the powerless, challenging those in power, encouraging young people, and protecting our democracy, providing and performing leadership in the matter of oversight of government is simply came natural to Elijah Cummings. Thank you, Larry. Um, and next we'll ha we have Dave Rapallo. Great, Th thanks Jen. And thanks so much for hosting this event. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, I had the privilege of serving with Mr. Cummings for um, most of his time, if not all of his time, on the Oversight Committee. I was a junior staffer, he was a junior member um, up until the time he was the chair and I was the staff director. Um, I have a very small story, it's a, it's a minute story as he would say. Um, mine focuses on one of his most significant investigations which was on um, drug pricing. Uh, he focused for years on this issue uh, in, the min in the minority. Uh, it, when he became chairman, it was the first hearing he held uh, it was the subject of the meeting that he had with President Trump at the White House in his first months as chair. Uh, this was a, for him, it was a multi-year, multi-Congress effort, uh, but there's one particular incident that always stuck with me, and that was relating to this guy, Martin Shkreli. I don't know if people know who Martin Shkreli is, but he was the CEO of a drug company called Turing Pharmaceuticals, uh, and they sold a drug called Daraprim. And this drug's used to treat a disease that strikes uh, pregnant women, cancer patients, and AIDS patients. It's an old drug, an older drug, but Shkreli obtained the exclusive rights to it. And then he increased the price from about $13 a pill to $750 a pill. So we were at the, in the minority at the time, and Chairman Cummings was working very hard to be as bipartisan as possible with the chairman at the time, uh, Jason Chaffetz. Uh, he visited his district in Utah. He worked with them on Secret Service reform. And so Chairman Cummings, or Ranking Member Cummings at that time, and Chairman Chaffetz, um, talked about this, agreed to call Shkreli to testify before the committee. Um, to his credit, Chairman Chaffetz did invite him, but he refused to come, Shkreli. Uh, then they talked some more, and they decided to issue a subpoena. Uh, and again, to his credit, Chairman Chaffetz agreed to issue the subpoena and required him to come. So right before the hearing, um, we got word that Shkreli was going to take the fifth. So normally, when a witness takes the fifth, a committee won't necessarily call that person to come and do it at a public hearing. But in this case, Shkreli was also tweeting, saying maybe he would talk, maybe he wouldn't talk, nobody was really sure. So again, um, Chairman Chaffetz and Ranking Member Cummings talked about this and decided they were going to have him come in and actually see if he would talk. Uh, so the hearing came and he did take the fifth and pretty predictably some of the members attacked him for his actions and his, you know, what they viewed as heartlessness and his increasing his price. But that is not the approach that Chairman Cummings took. Uh, what, what happened next was really something. Uh, Mr. Cummings actually tried to reach out to him and connect with him and uplift him. Um, I went back and I watched the clip again, and it's pretty amazing because even as Representative Cummings was doing this, Shkreli was smirking, 
and sort of nodding sarcastically and sort of mocking the whole process. But this is what um, Mr. Cummings actually said to him. And I'll just read a couple lines. He said, uh, Mr. Shikrali, I want to ask you, no, I want to plead with you to use any of your remaining influence you have over your former company to press them to lower the price of this drug. And he said, you can look away if you want, uh, but I wish you could see the faces of people who can't get the drugs they need. You are in a unique position. You really are, sir. You have a spotlight. You have a platform. You could use that attention to come clean, right your wrongs, and become one of the most effective patient advocates in the country, one that can make a big difference in so many people's lives. He went on a little later to say, I truly believe you could become a force of tremendous good. Of course, you can ignore this if you like, he said to him, but all I ask is that you reflect on it. I don't ask, Mr. Shikrelli, I beg that you reflect on this. There are so many people that could use your help. May God bless you. <laughs> so that's what happened at the hearing. It was incredible, um, but it wasn't unusual for Mr. Cummings and anybody who knows him. Um, as long as I knew him, he always tried to connect with people, uh, even those that disagreed with him, convince them if he could about his position and uplift everyone in the process. And he actually uplifted the committee that day too, because you know, some of the other members were sparring over whether Shikrelli may have waived his privilege or they were trying to sort of um, bait him into answering questions. But Mr. Cummings didn't do that. He said, I respect your constitutional right. I'm not gonna impress you for that. But what I wanna do is try to connect with you and try and uplift you and the entire committee. And I think he always used to say, we're better than this. I really think that's what he meant. He was trying to uplift everyone. So that's my, uh, that's my memory. Thank you. Um, and then next we have Vernon Sims. Thanks, Jen, and thank you for hosting this event. Um, Mr. Cummings was a person who kept seeking answers, kept growing personally, kept looking to learn new things. When he first came to Congress, he was, uh, interested in appropriations um, because he thought that appropriations would be the best committee to give resources back to his district. He was disappointed when he was appointed to the, um, the Transportation Committee Subcommittee on Coast Guard Maritime Transportation as the chair. He, he um, commented that, that he had to take time to learn the difference between a boat and a ship. Um, but he was chair and after 9-11, the Coast Guard undertook a massive modernization program called Deepwater and then it ended up over its head. The $24 million project turned into a fiasco and triggered a Justice Department investigation. Deepwater would include 91 new ships and 124 small boats plus new planes and helicopters. But Five years into the program, the Coast Guard had fewer boats and ships than it did before it started. Congressman Cummings, as chair of the Coast Guard Committee, called the program, quote, a mess. In March 2007, Congressman Cummings convened a subcommittee hearing to examine the Coast Guard's fiscal 2008 budget regarding the deep water procurement program. Lucinda Leslie was the key staff person for the subcommittee and did all of the, the great work that helped Congressman Cummings uh, over, oversee that effort. Later, during a 60 minutes interview, Steve Croft asked Congressman Cummings if he thinks the Coast Guard is in worse shape now than before it was before it was, uh, it began deep water. And Congressman Cummings tells Croft, quote, they say they're not, but I think there are. On the outside, the Coast Guard didn't have the resources to run a $24 billion project. It outsourced the entire program, including construction and day-to-day -day management to private sources. But they found that the radios, which were vital for communication with other boats, helicopters, got when they got wet, they didn't work. The antennas and electronic components on the exterior of the boat wouldn't survive the extreme weather the Coast Guard had to operate in. 
even something as simple as placement of security cameras made no sense. They installed the cameras and there were blind spots. And of course, you don't want blind spots. The boat's electronic communication system, which failed to meet government security standards, voice and data transmissions could leak out and be monitored by anyone, jeopardizing the Coast Guard's secret messages. In addition, tests show that the technical design of the Coast Guard cutters had to be scrapped, which meant that $38 million in development costs went down the drain. There were problems with stress and metal fatigue for the cutters that were being built. And after a few weeks in the water, all eight boats experienced severe structural problems and had to be pulled out of service. They were tied up at a pier at the Coast Guard Baltimore shipyard waiting to be decommissioned. And the Coast Guard determined that the problems were too serious to be fixed. Mr. Cummings said, quote, we should not allow situations to occur where you spend $14 million for a boat that doesn't float. Steve Croft in his 60 Minutes interview asked Mr. Cummings, how does that happen? Cummings said, quote, I don't know. The thing I'll tell you, and I think I know partly, it started with some people not either paying attention or people who didn't care or people who were greedy or people who were incompetent or people who lacked integrity or a combination of all. Mr. Cummings was a fierce advocate for oversight and his last quote was, he said, we must ensure that the government gets exactly what it's paid for and that all assets acquired under deep water meet contract specifications. So the committee chairmanship that he didn't want, he turned into something of benefit and became a fierce advocate for um, the, the use of government funds. Thank you. Thank you. And, and now we have Trudy. Thanks, Jen. Um, and thank you so much for hosting this event. And uh, I'm just really grateful for the opportunity to join everyone and also to see uh, colleagues and friends that I haven't seen in a while. So it's great that although we're virtual, we're still able to, to see one another. So I'm really excited about this event. I wanted to focus um, some on what um, Congressman Cummings did in his district. Of course, <clears throat> uh, his oversight work uh, uh, in DC and his uh, committee assignments and, and through legislation is uh, a lot of was a lot of his focus, but he did practice oversight in his district and what he did of um, you know perhaps not through legislation, but using his position to make sure that people in power are held accountable and to make sure um, as everyone on this panel has already um, stated his uh, his work was grounded in service. So to make sure that he's helping um, people to get access to opportunity. Um, <clears throat> all of his work was grounded in service to people he called the unemployed, unapplauded, unappreciated, and underserved. And he used his position as a congressional leader to serve and create change for these people. Uh, one of the ways in which he did that was by holding developers in his district who were building projects accountable, ensuring that small, local, minority and women-owned companies would have access to the business opportunities that are associated with these projects. What would happen is that um, small businesses would see development projects that were going on in their own backyard, and the contracts were going to companies that weren't even in the state. Uh, and they would let congressmen companies know that this was happening. And so one project in particular that Congressman Cummings got involved with was the East Baltimore Development Initiative. And that was an 88 acre redevelopment project that promised commercial buildings, including biotech companies, a hotel, also new homes and an elementary school. Uh, Congressman Cummings was determined to make sure that the people who lived and worked in this community would have access to the opportunities being created there. So he told quarterly informational sessions and would bring together the developer and the small businesses to talk about 
uh, what a part of the project was starting, what types of trades were needed, what small businesses needed to do to be eligible to compete for the contracts. She also worked with the nonprofit organization responsible for the project to make sure they had an economic inclusion plan that included measurable goals and provisions for holding developers accountable if they didn't meet those goals. What he did with EBDI served as a blueprint for other development projects in this district. And it got to the point, literally, Congressman Cummings would just be riding around, would see a, a sign that's coming up with a certain developer's name on it, and then call me and tell them to send out our letter <laughs> about economic inclusion. And uh, you know, those letters uh, became so well known that developers would reach out to Congressman Cummings before they even started the project to let them know about their economic inclusion plans and to start the process for making sure that we had these quarterly sessions where they can uh, let small businesses know about opportunities. So that's just one example of how Congressman Cummings used oversight as a tool for implementing effective policies that helped his constituents in addition to his legislative work in DC. Thank you. Thanks so much for sharing all of your stories. And as I was listening, it seems like there are really four themes that each of you touched on um, in various ways. And, and the first picking up on Trudy's story is a uh, commitment to community and, and Mr. Cummings' uh, strong commitment to community, whether it was through his high school and connections that he made in high school all the way through his service in, um, on, on, in oversight in Congress. In addition, the second theme that, that really came out in all of your comments was a commitment to learning and, and, and inquiry and knowing that in order to make the world a better place and to serve your community, you need to constantly be striving to learn new things and to inquire about the world. Um, the third theme that seemed to come out in each one of your stories was compassion and that you need to interact with others and conduct yourself with compassion and because that tends to, to resonate with people and to help you get the things that you want to achieve done um, much more effectively than aggression. And then the, the final uh, theme that, that really came out in all of your, your comments was using all of these things, community, learning, and compassion to conduct high quality investigations. And so what I'd like to do is, is break our conversation down into those four different things and, and just talk a little bit more about it. So first this commitment to community. How do you think his community shaped the way uh, he conducted himself in both the Maryland State Legislature and then also ultimately in the US Congress? And that's open to anyone who wants to answer it. Well, keep in mind where he lived. I mean, it, it, this was not a matter he, uh, which he had to figure out what was going on. He lived in the community. <laughs> he lived in the heart of, uh, of, of, of West Baltimore. So he saw the community all the time. But I, 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 I know you want to follow this line, but can I, can I, ask, can I ask a question of Dave, of Trudy, and Vernon? Absolutely. Uh, that may, I think it will tie into this because I never knew whether when he used his most famous way of ending a thing, he really believed it. He would always say, often say, we're better than this. And then I'd meet him up. I said, Elijah, no, we aren't. No, we, no we're not. This, I mean, <laughs> uh, and I was never able clear to get a clarity whether he believed it or whether that was aspirational uh, uh, or what? I mean, we, we would talk about it, but I could never, I mean, I, there are times when I actually challenged him. Elijah, that is nonsense. We aren't any better. Look what the, this country has been doing and all of these years, et cetera. Do you, I, I, what do y'all think? Did Elijah really believe we were better than that? Or was he essentially saying we ought to be or hope, I hope we could get to be better? I mean, that's not, that's not your agenda, Jennifer. But, but I got these folks in front of me and I've, I've, I've been asking myself that for a long time. I advertise this to you guys as a coffee hour. So let's do it. Let's have a conversation. 
Yes, Your Honor, I would say yes. He, he, he absolutely believed it. The proof was for me that he had um, what some people would consider to be unreasonable expectations as his normal expectations. I'll give you a, a real quick example. His car was stolen and he was in Washington. A constituent called the office and, and cursing was not happy that the congressman's car was in a particular area of Baltimore when he was supposed to be in Washington. I called him and asked him, uh, do you have your car? And he was not happy. No, I don't have my car, it was stolen. So I said, I know where your car is. It's, it's in the area, uh, it, a woman has called and said your car is there. She was upset because she thought you were um, sleeping around or something because your car was in this area. Um, he said, oh, great. And this was his normal expectation. He said, can you go get it for me? My key is in the drawer of my middle drawer of my office. Can you go get it? No, no, he didn't say, can you go get it? He said, go get it for me. So I went and stole back his stolen car. <laughs> that was his normal expectation, which some people would say was an unreasonable expectation. I just think that he thought in a way that he actually believed because of a number of things that his expectations were normal and some people would say they were extraordinary. He got his car back um, and uh, it was a happy ending ultimately, but he uttered without thinking about it, can you go get it from me? Because that was his, this is his car. So stealing back his car seemed like a normal expectation. So I would say, yes, he believed it. I think he believed it because he really did not think that someone was the representative representation of the worst of themselves. So if someone, um, you know, got in trouble with the law, um, you know, wasn't, um, you know, maybe wasn't the best student, so something, something horrible happened in their life. And a lot of people would then determine sorts of stereotypes about about that person based on that one instance and he never did that he never thought that a person was reflected on whatever worst thing that happened to them he always saw the best in people he always um and that's why he did have those high expectations because he believed he believed it was possible he believed that the guy who's you know, father was in jail and mother was dead and, you know, <clears throat> didn't have a lot of great resources in his school. He believed that if you gave him the resources that you could find in other richer part of his districts, that this, that this student could do as well. And he, um, a, an example of that is when he was the, the Coast Guard uh, subcommittee chair, he found out that there was no school in his district that focused on maritime. And he was like, how can I be the chair of this committee? And I have no public school in my district that focuses on maritime. And he went and found a school, basically adopted the school, you know, <clears throat> got a bunch of uh, people in the maritime industry to invest in the school mm -hmm. so that these students could have access to opportunities in maritime. And these are students you know, just like him, may not have even thought that this is even anything that's of interest mm -hmm. <laughs> to them, but, um, or that they could actually pursue uh, education and a career in that, but that never came to his mind. He just thought, I'm in a position that I can provide resources, I can gather people who will help them, I'm going to invest in this school, and these students are going to succeed. And, it, you know, and he, he didn't think of, okay, this is an inner city school that doesn't get resources, usually um, they're starting so far behind, how are they going to catch up? Like, none of that came to him. None of that came to him. And I really do believe it's because he never would identify a person by the worst thing that happened to them. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And it's a great question because it, you know, it's a philosophical one. Is it aspirational or descriptive or, or that sort of thing? In a way, I sort of think it was all of it. Like he knew in his heart that people were better than exactly like, like you just said, better than their worst act. But it was also the striving, right? That's what it was. And I think that's what he took the oversight. And just, just for the record, if anybody doesn't have it, you should go get his book uh, that he did. 
But he did that all the time. Like if you think about the um, probably one of his most famous moments was the Michael Cohen hearing. At the end of that hearing, like the hearing was a little bit of a circus. It was um, very partisan. Uh, it was not the best moment. But then he elevated everybody at the end of that hearing by doing exactly that, by acknowledging the fact that he knew in his heart that, that everybody was better than you know, their behavior that day. Uh, but also he did it with Michael Cohen himself. You know, if you remember that exchange with Cohen, you know, he, he put, it on, put it on him to change his life and what, what his story meant to America at that moment. So I, in a way, I think it's sort of both. I think he both really believed it and it was the, the act of being aspirational too. Mm -hmm. He talked a lot about that Cohen. I, I'll tell you what struck him. For some, he saw Cohen as the father of a daughter who had this um, disability. Somehow, did she come to a hearing? Was she on crutches or something? Something that he, he, he told me about this about eight times. I didn't see it, but there was something about Cohen's daughter that was a disability. And that stuck in Elijah's mind, whatever else, he is the loving father of this daughter. <laughs> so, I mean, I remember arguing with him. I said, I mean, I don't know whether Al Capone had, had children. I'm sure he loved his children too. I mean, so did, I mean, I'm, I'm much more cynical. And, and and so I hear what you're saying, I, I, Jennifer. Excuse me for for hijacking this part of your thing, but this is a question I've had in my mind about Elijah for fifty some years, and so now I've got the experts to answer it. So yeah, let me get off of your agenda. Oh no, no, no. So picking up on the we are better than that, and also on the on the partisanship thing, particularly in in the latter years of his career. Um, there's so much discussion about the divisiveness in politics. Do you think he found his job to be more difficult now and that he got more frustrated given the divisiveness or is it just, it's, is it the same problems that we consistently face over and over and over again? Well, he would, he would, he would challenge obstacles. Um, he would talk to his colleagues on the other side of the aisle, in spite of his Democratic um, colleagues saying, there's no point. And he would often curb some of their behavior. Um, and some of them grew to, to be friendly with him and, and they would call themselves friends. And um, I would say he was not frustrated by it because, well, well it, it's hard to say not he was passionate and frustrated about not doing anything fast enough or effective enough or efficient enough, as he would, would say. But he would not allow the obstacles to deter him from continuing to find ways around, under, through, um, above, below the obstacle to get to the point where he wanted to get to. He wasn't always successful but he didn't see the obstacle as a matter of frustration to discontinue whatever he wanted to get done. I, I have another question. <laughs> this drug price thing, that bugged him. What was that about? I mean, that uh, but the prices of, of stuck in his crawl, he would talk about it. He would complain. You'd be talking to him about something else, and that would come up. Well, why? But I never got clear what was the genesis of this. Was there some specific event? What, what was that it was, all about? It was, it was a bunch of constituents and, and his own family's experience. Um, he would be at uh, Home Depot, or and someone would come up to him and, and start crying and thank him or trying to get drug prices reduced and explain to him that they had to, to, to make a decision between buying food or getting drugs. And he, he did relay a story where a person actually said that they were buying dog food because it was cheaper than buying food. They were buying dry dog food because they 
had to have the medicine and they couldn't afford both. And uh, he also knew of situations, he was an attorney and where people had filed bankruptcy because of their health situation, you, having to use money that they saved or lived uh, their entire life savings for health or medical conditions. He was deeply affected. He was accessible and he was deeply affected by people's personal stories um, of suffering. And he thought the suffering should not happen in a country that had this kind of wealth. He, I, he told me one time, I think this is with the CVS up at North Avenue. This was about somebody, maybe this person was in line ahead of him. And the issue was which medicine? And the woman was asking what was the price? She was, this person was trying to decide which medicine to get. They, apparently she couldn't get them all. And she was juggling this. And that's just, I, 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 yeah, he did tell me about one of those times where it, it wasn't food or medicine, it was which medicine. But that, that was a genuine concern of his that was, and, and I was curious about what got it going. Yeah, I know on the on the committee, he would he would definitely relay personal stories like during a hearing we'd be having and he would he would talk about when he personally was in the hospital and somebody in the room next to him was about to get discharged and say, oh, you must be really happy you're heading home. And the other patient said, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nervous because when I go home, I might have to choose between whether I get my medication or whether we get food. So I'm scared to leave. And he would relay those personal stories in the context of the bigger investigation. And, and, it, and it kind of also goes to his long-term view of things. Like, yes, it, it can get extremely partisan, but you know, he took the long view and he was doing it out of the minority. He would work with the Senate if he could on certain projects. He would dedicate certain staff on the minority staff just to focus on this issue, even if the majority wasn't focusing on it. And then, like I said, his first hearing, um, he, as chair, he called a hearing on this topic, and I still remember Antoinette Worsham was the witness, and it was a woman who I believe lost her daughter because of uh, she couldn't get the insulin that she needed, and that was a perfect illustration of him trying to connect with the individual but related to the broader context. Um, the committee has now gone on to do many reports, and um, after he passed away, the Energy and Commerce Committee actually renamed the drug pricing bill after him. Um, and it passed the house. I think it's. I think it currently is still stuck in Build Back Better, but we're we're hopeful. <laughs> I mean, he actually believed. So this is combining two themes: this belief and optimism about people in the drug crisis. Elijah actually believed that he could talk to Trump, convince Trump of this thing, and then get a different result just on that. I mean, you probably other people said, look, man, you're wasting your time. And not only that, is you, uh, Trump is just going to spin it to, to his benefit or whatever. But he thought that on this one, that just on the merits of it, that that he could produce some result. We, well, I, I never said that? to him you're wasting your time. By the way, with Elijah. <laughs> yeah, we, I, I never said to him you're wasting your time because he was, he was capable of doing many things that people thought he couldn't do. And he demonstrated that he, he honestly believed when he sat down with President Trump that they had an honest, forthright conversation. And if I, re I remember correctly, Dave can correct me. When he left the room, he thought that he had somebody to work with on reducing prescription drug prices in President Trump. As it turned out, after he left the room, the conversation as relayed by the president was different than his recollection of the conversation. Yeah, that's exactly right. We, we, on our way in, and he wasn't naive about it. He knew you know, that it, I guess he viewed it more as his responsibility on behalf of everyone who's trying to help to go to this meeting and try and make the best case he could. And he went with Congressman Welch um, and our, our health staff, um, uh, Allie Golden in particular, and, and others drafted a bill that he could carry with him to allow the government to negotiate with drug companies for, for drug prices, which they're currently prohibited from doing. So he brought that bill with him. He tried his best and made his best case. I think, Vernon, the, 
remark you're you're thinking about is he again he's trying to uplift everyone he said to the president i believe you can be one of the best presidents if you make these changes to help people uh, of course then afterwards it was sort of warped into he said i'm the best president in the world and then that led to some negative comments about baltimore and a whole other uh, saga, but I think he really did feel like it, it was his responsibility and the president had made all these comments during the campaign about how the drug companies are getting away with murder and we have to take action. So he thought, you know, if there's any chance, I have to seize it. Trudy, um, as uh, how, how did how did you guys manage that um, from a communications perspective? at that time. Yeah, it wasn't a great time for a communications perspective. And I actually, um, I didn't want him to go. I, I said, if you go, you have to go with another member. Um, because I, I knew that, you know, Trump would spin it the way he'd spin it. And, you know, it, he had the Twitter, Twitter sphere at that point and that it would just go out of control. So I, di I didn't want him to go. But, um, you know, after that happened and, you know, <laughs> and I remember him calling me, he's like, I said, if, I said, if. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, we got to exactly what the exchange was. And again, because he was who he was, because he had, you know, the, re the reputation of such strong integrity and because, um, you know, people understood his way of thinking it was not that difficult to get the story back on track and to exactly what happened and exactly why you know Mr. Cummings was there and and what the exchange was and it's because he had developed again years of experience and goodwill from people for them to know that you know what his intention was and and another thing about um Congressman Cummings is he did not have patience for, for, for things that was that were not common sense. Um, there was a meeting once that we had with a um, <clears throat> a charter school that was having um, a disagreement with the the teachers union, and of course Congressman Cummings is a union guy. He talks about his father having a union card and. Um, supports unions 100%, but he just was so frustrated that these adults, the school and the teachers union leadership, their argument was impacting students getting an education. And he literally, like he slammed his head on the table and the meeting was with the school and Congressman Cummings and he slammed his head on the table and he said, get the union rep on the phone right now. And I went and did that. <laughs> and so we had, he had a conversation and there again, he figured if I could just talk sense to these people that are having this disagreement, then we can get rid of the log jam and let the students get the, the help that they need. And he really, he just, he, again, he just didn't have patience for things that were just to him common sense didn't have patience for people who didn't understand things that to him were just common sense. Well, um, I would like to point out that uh, some of the investigations that we've discussed up to this point, including the drug pricing and social or the Secret Service and Deepwater are all featured in our portraits of oversight uh, on uh, Elijah Cummings. So I had needed to get that plug in there before we continue on. Uh, but um, one of the questions that I, I, I kind of would like to hear your perspective on is how his perspective of legislative oversight evolved over the course of his career. Um, I think up until this point, we've heard that there was a there were constant themes in his career, but I'd like to for you guys to reflect a little bit on on the evolution of his career. Well, I, I guess I could take a crack. I, I he was actually pretty consistent. I'm not sure he changed. He he was like the North Star. If he knew what he was going for, uh, he would keep his eye trained on that goal. 
And if people were willing to work with them, great. If they weren't, then, you know, he would try and convince them. But he changed. I guess the one thing I would say in terms of a change, and again, I don't even know if this was a change or just I happened to notice it, but working in the minority, I know that the Levin Center is famous for highlighting bipartisan investigations as sort of the gold standard, which of course it is. But when you're in the minority, or even when you're in the majority and the other side simply isn't cooperating, it's sort of hard to hear that you need to meet that standard when you can't. But that said, um, one thing that he did is he worked at being bipartisan. So it wasn't just an idea of I support that or I don't. And the example that I'll give is, so he had, uh, I guess we had uh, Isa as the first chair and then Mr. Chaffetz had come in. And so one change is when, when Mr. Chaffetz was the chair, he came to me and he said, I want you to put me on any letter you think I would agree with, you know, consult with me about it, but let's make the default be that I want to sign on joint, jointly to letters if we can, which is not necessarily the standard operating procedure. And so he started signing on to witness requests and document requests and hearing notices and anything, significant ones, uh, launching investigations. And I, I checked the, the date. I think um, by June 14th, he had signed 600 letters jointly with Chairman Chaffetz. So he worked at that. And then the flip side of it is they actually had a relationship. So when he wanted to have Martin Shkreli come as a witness, he could go have that conversation or when he wanted to work on Secret Service. And I don't think he was doing it only for the benefit that resulted. I think he really wanted to form a, a bond, but it highlighted to me that a lot of members now maybe don't think about the work it takes to create that bipartisan space. And he really did uh, recognize it. Yeah, I guess my question was was not so much uh, evolution in terms of being the North Star or in, in terms of philosophy, but more in terms of experience. So would he have known, you know, what, would he have put his name on all those letters earlier in his career? Is that something that comes from experience and, you know, inquiry and learning and, and that sort of thing? I, I think the answer is yes. I mean, he, he did not want the committee chairmanship of the Coast Guard subcommittee. Yeah. He wanted appropriations. So he started with his, his way of thinking about how he was gonna approach Congress as a new member. And he adjusted very quickly to make um, his own thoughts fit the opportunities that he saw. Yeah, and even in the, in correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, but even in the beginning um, <clears throat> on the oversight committee, he often was given the best questions to ask because, um, you know, he just had great delivery. I mean, he was an amazing orator, so he had great delivery. And, and, and he, again, was always looking for the connection with the person he was questioning so that, you know, it wasn't just a show for the sake of a show, but actually getting to the truth of the matter, the heart of the matter, and and moving moving things forward <clears throat> to the best of um, you know his ability, whatever whatever arena or circumstance he was in. So I really do think that that uh, it, it was pretty much at the very beginning the way that he was at the end started at the beginning. And um, at this point, I think one of the things that would be helpful would be to engage our audience instead of me asking questions. So if anyone has any questions that they would like uh, me to ask on your behalf, just uh, drop them in the chat and then we can we can go from there. And if, if no one has any questions, which I highly doubt, then I'm happy to continue to facilitate the conversation. While, while you are waiting for the questions, um, as to your last question, um, the big change, of course, was the coming into being in the majority and being the chair. Um, I mean, he, he was absolutely delighted. I mean, he looked forward to a period of time uh, as the uh, a chair because as the ranking minority, he would, he would tell me, he says, you know what I am? 
I'm, 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 uh, the, 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 the majority is so abusive that I am forced into the position of being the administration's lawyer on the committee. That's that. Those were literally his words, uh, describing to some extent what his role was in the minority, with uh, some of the uh, the some of the hearings, and uh, particularly I think the uh, uh, what was the Hillary Clinton the African place Benghazi. Uh, Benghazi. Benghazi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Benghazi. But there were others. So. He, he didn't really want to be, but he, he thought that he almost had to be, as he called it, the lawyer for the, for the administration. And uh, um, just to, to, to hold down what he thought was their abuse. And he actually really looked forward to a nice long period. But well, anyway, he, he, he was delighted to become, to get the gavel. Well, on that note, one of the questions that was just asked was how, as chairman, did he work to educate new members about oversight, why it matters and what good oversight looks like versus what gotcha oversight looks like? Um, is it about headlines and little else, that sort of thing? So I, Dave's is much more capable to answer this question, but I will want to, I do want to say that he loved, like he loved mentoring younger, newer members. And he was really excited about the opportunity to bring on new members onto the committee and, um, you know, sit down and talk with them and, you know, give them advice and help to, to, to groom them for the role. That was exciting to him. Any opportunity to, uh, be able to to help newer members along their trajectory. He 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 just jumped at that opportunity. I, I would agree with that. I think he 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 took a lot of time with members and with staff. Um, he asked us to write a, a lot of memos, background memos for the members of the committee, um, and then he would also just <laughs> at at committee events or, or hearings or markups or whatever it was. He would just explain his vision. Uh, repeatedly, just so that everybody knew uh, what the goal was. I completely agree with Trudy that if Elijah had not gone this route, one thing that he would have enjoyed doing was being what I, a, a law professor. After he got out of law school, at this time, uh, Maryland had a fairly low bar passage rate, around 50%. Uh, but these are the graduates failing of all the law schools passing the bar exam. Elijah took it upon himself for maybe about six years to just tutor graduates of the law school as to the bar exam. No compensation. Uh, he's busy trying to get his uh, law practice uh, going. He, he, he did this. And you could see it throughout uh, 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 his career what, what Trudy just mentioned, this, this kind of teacher instinct. I mean, he would have been a very, very good teacher by profession. Yeah, in addition to that, um, and I don't remember the specifics, but he also had a program for ex-offenders uh, who were um, coming back to society. And again, just like um, Larry mentioned, uh, wasn't paid for it. Um, he just would get together his uh, friends and colleagues in other industry, African American um, uh, people who are successful in their careers in Baltimore, bring them together and have them sit and have these one-on-one -on -one sessions with ex-offenders, and you know, figuring out what their needs were, and you know, putting together a plan essentially for them to be able to transition back into their communities. And that, like I said, was not anything that was he was paid for or got recognition for, but he felt that um, it was something that he should do. Another thing that he would say is that he was an ordinary man called to an extraordinary mission. And he really did believe that whatever, wherever he found himself, that he needed to rise to the challenge to, to meet that commitment so or that responsibility. So whatever it was, right? like. Um, you know, he tells the story about when he was first really handpicked by Lena K. Lee, his predecessor, to run for office. He had no desire to run for office, 
but she'd seen him, the work that he was doing in the community, what he was doing with um, trying to help people pass the bar and other things like that. And, and he says that she said, I was looking, for, she was a, a woman attorney. She was like, I, she says, I was looking for a woman, but you'll do. And uh, she helped him run. And that wasn't what he was planning on doing, but he then took it and clearly look, look at his trajectory he ran with it and that that's always been I think his um his uh perception of wherever he finds himself that I'm supposed to use this opportunity to help people the best way that I can and to rise to the occasion and and he was a very spiritual man and he believed that you know that God would had prepared him for whatever opportunity. Another thing he would say is that everything that happened to you before this moment prepares you for this moment. And so he believed that, you know, whatever, like wh whatever um, problems or situations or setbacks or anything that happened in, in his life or anyone's life, that all of those experiences are going to be used for the better for whatever is coming next. He really, he really did believe that. And following up on uh, the decision to run, one of the questions in the chat is uh, it, wondering if you can talk a little bit about what it, what uh, Mr. Cummings' elections were like and whether they were challenging, how he pro he approached re-election and fundraising, that sort of thing. Let's, let's I just think working from... for a Democrat, I'm sorry, running real quick, mm -hmm. in a you know Republican-leaning state right now, so much easier. <laughs> For Mr. Cummings, but sorry, go ahead, Vernon. <laughs> so let's start from at the beginning of his election to Congress. So Kwasi Mfume is congressman. He is uh, retires to go to the NAACP to be president. Mr. Cummings and I think 34 other people are running for the office. Mr. Cummings is going to Annapolis to personally file and his car breaks down. He calls a friend of his and says, the Lord is trying to tell me something. I, I don't think I should do this. And he had an older car. And the friend said to him, um, basically, you need to get another car. And so he files, he wins. His elections, his, his campaigns were always based on the fact that he would say, I only have two years. And so he would try to do everything that he could within the two years. He ran as if he was going to lose all the time. Um, he did not like fundraising, but he had to do it and he did, he did it. He would reluctantly do it. He was uh, very organized and he had the same, he was the same person on the campaign side as he was on the political side. He would do all the things that he, he would do. He would find opportunities to mentor some younger person he would offer as much as he could on the campaign side in some kind of service or assistance to people. Um, he, but he was a fierce campaign, campaigner um, and he acted and demonstrated his run as if he was going to lose. He never took it for granted, even when he got close to 80% on a regular basis of the electorate, um, he never took it for granted. Um, a more substantive question that we received, it was one of the first ones we received, was um, what Mr. Cummings' stance was on disability rights and uh, particularly during the disability protests during the past. P part of it is, I mean, the simple answer is that he, he supported it, um, but I don't remember the specific that the person is talking about, but he, he any, come, I think coming out of special education and being told, you know, you, you, you're gonna be in special education. So he comes out of special education, has a conversation with a counselor, the counselor, he says to the counselor, I wanna be an attorney. And the counselor says to him, well, why don't you pick something more realistic? Um, and he goes on to be an attorney. So he was a, a champion for anyone who found themselves in a situation where someone was saying they couldn't do something because of who they were or what they looked like. So across the board, he was supportive. 
And um, the, the, the one of the next questions we received was, um, you, you talked a little bit about hearings and um, writing reports and putting together background information. Uh, how did he prepare for hearings and how did the, did the staff provide extensive memos with documents or did it mostly consist of, of oral reviews? But from, from our perspective, it was, it, he was an over preparer. So he, it was all of the above. He wanted memos, he wanted the oral briefing, he wanted the underlying documents you were relying on. And then he would take it all and he would read everything and then I'm sure uh, you all can back me up. He'd, we'd usually get emails three, four in the morning. Hey, you're missing one of the documents you were supposed to get me <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, he would, um, usually the, the mornings before big hearings, he would like to be calm and think through everything that he had been dealing with. We would try to script stuff out for him, but he was just so good at reading the room and the moment that he would always make whatever we tried to do a hundred times better when, when it actually came out during a hearing or something. Um, but he, he definitely was one of these guys who wants to read everything to feel that level of comfort and then just be able to have his direct um, question or point come across that way. And I'm sure he was the same for press too. <laughs> and like a, he was like a prize fighter in this sense. Before big hearings, he would be in, in an office listening to spiritual music. Um, to get him to get him his mind right, warm himself up, or whatever, whatever it did for him, it would not be unusual to find him in an office listening to music to get himself together, like he was going into a fight. Yeah, and for for press and for spe for speeches in particular, we uh, so Congressman Cummings had a long term long time speechwriter, and uh, you know, and it. Any speech, small, a five-minute speech or an hour-long speech, um, the speechwriter would come back to the staffer who was with him and say, "How did he do? He did really well. Did he use any of it? He used good afternoon." <laughs> that was essentially <laughs> what he used. I mean, he used, of course, the essence of the speech, but like Dave said, he would, and he and he wanted it right. He would want the twenty pages of information and he would take that in and then he would go out and deliver, internalize it and then deliver it in, in a way that only that only he could. And on that note, how, can you talk about how his committee and personal staff worked together on his oversight and policy agenda? Well, there, there is a restriction, a, a budgetary restriction between how much you can do as a committee how much you can do in a personal office, but he he without breaking any rules, he had a seamless operation. He was one of the, the first members of Congress that I know of that the Congress has a very bureaucratic structure: chief of staff, deputy chief of staff, member, legislative director. The committee also has a bureaucratic structure. He actually merge together the bureaucratic structure and a network structure together. And so that means that he would break the bureaucratic structure when he wanted to, to go into the network structure. And that network structure may be something where he read 167 pages of something. And then he went to a person who was sitting at the front desk, who was a staff director, called them in and said, what do you think about this? Something in the speech. Um, so he used the, a network where people have more control and sort of do more. So anyone in the network is at, a, at the similar level and the bureaucratic structure together. And so um, it, Dave will co correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think it was very seamless from, from my side of the personal office side. Yeah, it, de it definitely was. And also, he, w once you all moved uh, offices, just logistically speaking, he, Mr. Cummings got an office right across the hall from the committee suite. So it really was like we had this entire corner of the Rayburn building and he would have meetings over there. And you know, sometimes we would go over um, and ironically, the office right next to his was Mark Meadows, 
who he really had a relationship with. And so I would go over and see Vern and Trudy and say, where's the boss? We're supposed to be giving him a briefing. They say, oh, he's next door with, with Mr. Meadows. And so he'd have to wait. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, I would definitely say in terms of the, the personal office and the committee office working together, we were both physically and, you know, professionally all in, uh, working together. <laughs> I was muted because my dogs were barking. I apologize. <laughs> um, I, uh, um, the next question is that one article that someone read was called The Re Reluctant Partisan. Do you think that is an accurate description of Representative Cummings? Why or why not? Um, I, I do, yeah. I think um, he would much prefer to be on the same page uh, with the other side, whether he was in the minority or the majority. Um, I think someone, I think, um, Larry, you mentioned the Benghazi investigation. So not many people know this, but at the beginning of the select committee's investigation, he sat down with Chairman Gowdy and they sketched out an investigative plan and it included document requests, hearings, a schedule for all of the hearings. And he made his commitment that if we, if this is the joint agreed upon plan, he would be, um, you know, okay with going forward and, and assist and, and do everything he could. The problem was once this sort of thing about Hillary's email came out, the majority side dumped the entire schedule, dumped all the hearings that they were going to hold, and just wanted to focus on that. And that's the reason it, it became so partisan at the end. He, he was very reluctant about that. Um, our next question is uh, based on Vernon's comment about his perspective of seeing our time at short and looking at things at, in two year time frames. Uh, so can you comment on how that affected his approach to oversight and legislation and his time on the Hill more generally? He wanted everything done immediately. And um, he would push for that to happen. He would push his colleagues. Um, he, would, he would be very upset if something didn't seem to make common sense to him. And he would move forward and he had no problem engaging people personally, um, whether, whether it was another member of Congress, whether it was leadership of Congress, whether it was an individual. Um, so he was, he, he would say something about the urgency of now, which I think he got from President Obama. He would, he would talk about it all the time. Um, he, would, he would have a situation where his, someone wrote something for him and he would deliver it and the word was the wrong word. And he would be upset about the, the word or he would be upset about the fact that Ms. Jones got a letter with a mistake in it. And I didn't have the luxury of saying, well, Congressman, we sent out 30,000 letters. Because his answer would be, well, Ms. Jones only got Ms. Jones's letter. So he was, he was fiercely thoughtful about getting stuff done. I've been thinking about what I think the question is, is, uh, is somewhat about over the last, so I've been thinking about the last year or so. Did I notice any increased urgency because of awareness on his part about his medical conditions in a way that most of us did not know about. And I, I, I can't say that, uh, that I noticed um, a change because what Vernon just mentioned, this, the, the, this urgency of now went on for years. It, 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 it wasn't a last near the end of his life period. He would say, uh, my constituents are needy or something. He had, he had exp I can't remember, maybe Trudy. My people need me. That's what he would uh, say. Uh, my people need me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but that was that didn't just start. And uh, this person really needs that, or et cetera. He focused on their urgency and that it was urgent to them. So uh, I, 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 I've kind of concluded that I did not see an acceleration of urgency beyond what was already the urgency that he was, you know, that he recognized earlier. I think we can yeah. all attest, I'm sorry, okay. to the fact that it wouldn't be unusual 
for us to get a call before technology changed and then emails or whatever mode of communication he used. And it may go like this, Vernon, I saw Ms. Jones in the Home Depot and she said, X, Y, Z, I need you to take care of this today, today, today. That, that was his style. Um, he was in the hospital, barely able to move. And he insisted on having subpoenas delivered to him that he had to sign himself. And when I, when I was being thoughtful and said, well, you know, can't somebody else do this? And he said, no, nobody else can do it, I'm the chair. So the so the the subpoenas were personally delivered to him to sign in the hospital, and he was focused on the importance of that, even though he was gravely ill. But but Vernon, did you see any change as we in in the later months or so, or was this kind of urgency always there? Because my sense is that it was always there. It it was always there. I think it increased. Decrease as he as he got sick. I think it 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 got it got you could say better or worse. Um, <laughs> it increased. Yeah, I think it was always there. Um, he would, <clears throat> and I, I you know I started with him in two thousand two, and I remember uh, he would at that time he and he continued on using he would quote uh, a poem uh, Benjamin Mays the former Morehouse president, I only have a minute. And it's real brief, so I, I wanted to read it. Um, it says, I only have just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. I must suffer if I lose it, give account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. And you know that started years ago that he would quote that poem. And I really do think that it was, um, that that was that was who he was that's that's who and even if it weren't where if he was in the house of representatives you know there were talk of him becoming a senator and so if he had six years versus two years I think he still would have that sense of urgency in everything that he did and I will say too honestly that um you know he yeah as a black man he did feel that he had limited time that others might not have. He did feel that that you know his end may come sooner than others, uh, just because he was a black man and 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 you know he had struggles going on. And so I think that was also in the back of his mind too that longevity would be great and he would take it if he got it. But um, if he didn't, he was going to make sure that he can you know since we were talking about cars so much, ride, ride it until the wheels fall off, that he was gonna do everything that he could do in the time that he had. Um, and maybe on that, on that subject, uh, Larry, are you able to share another story about uh, Mr. Cummings making an impact in his early days, perhaps about his experience as a black man? What? Yeah, I guess this is a more general answer to that. There would be a times when he unintentionally, in his mind, offended some person, a poor person or a person with limited, and it would be passed and it would it would worry him. He 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 had this sense of 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 of, of not wanting to hurt. Uh Poor people, I guess I could just, oh, maybe any people. Uh, I, I don't know if that's responsive to the question, but 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 he would he would come back to it. I mean, I love, okay, you didn't intend that. Uh, that person didn't pay any attention. That would be my reaction. Did the, the, the Vernon or Trudy or uh, Dave have any of these? I think things? it's just poor people. He, he really did have a keen sense of that. I mean, <laughs> let's be clear. Like, like I said, you know, he uh, patience was not his virtue. So he would, you know, um, you know, he would, uh, uh, his way of doing things was a way that he can get results quickly. And sometimes that would come across as impatient. But I, re I remember when he, and again, I was just starting, I was a young staffer. There was an interview, uh, a news crew in his office. And he had um, asked me a question. I answered the question and then he snapped at me. And he 
after, I mean, I, I honestly didn't take it personally because everything was going on. It was crazy and things were, you know, it was, so I just was like, okay, whatever. And was going on. And he made a point of coming back to apologize and to say that you, I never want to disrespect my staff in front of, in front of, he didn't want to disrespect us period, but especially in front of uh, anyone else outside. Like he, he, I could tell that it was like, he was thinking about it and it bothered him that that interaction happened. And he wanted to make sure that he made clear to me that it did bother him and that he apologized for doing it. So yeah, he did have a, and if he didn't, um, if he, if like, if he was like having a bad day or if he was tired and now that we know he was sicker for longer than any of us knew. So if he was sick and he wasn't on his A game and so like say he was giving a speech for instance and you could just tell it just wasn't his best. He would feel badly after that because he felt that the people that came to see him had a level of expectation of him, just like Vernon said, how, as he expected of others. And he wanted to meet that expectation. And if he felt like he felt short, like he felt short, like I remember one time uh, it was, it was about transportation and, you know, it was a, a really wonky speech and he wanted to get everything right. And so he read the speech, which like I said, he rarely did. And so there wasn't that energy that usually happens when he gives speeches. And <clears throat> after the speech, he called the director of the organization to essentially apologize for feeling like he didn't do his best. And of course, the director of the organization was like, what are you talking about? You were amazing. You were fantastic. It was, um, you know, we we're just glad that you were here. But he, he really did strive to not only meet his own expectations of himself, uh, but he never wanted to let anyone down. And he, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he owned his own stuff. So if he did something like Trudy described, where he thought he, he hurt a staff person or offended him, he wouldn't say to me, go tell such and such, I'm sorry. He would actually call the person in and have a conversation with him about why he did what he did and in and, and, and all instances that I knew of, apologize. And uh, with that, I am going to thank you all for on absolutely lovely uh, discussion and turn it over to Jim for closing remarks. Um, I truly have enjoyed every moment of this. Thank you. Me too. This was really fun. Thank you, Jen. Jim. Or I can just close. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Um, uh, and um, I, so I'll just, I'll, I'll finish it up since we have two minutes and I want to eke out every single second uh, of, of this panel. Uh, the last set of questions that we received was about losing empathetic leaders and thinking about where we headed off in the future. So are you guys optimistic about where we're headed? I'm more than optimistic because Elijah Cummings wasn't trying to be famous. And before Elijah Cummings was Elijah, quote unquote, Elijah Cummings, we didn't know that Elijah Cummings was there. Well, I, I'll just, I, I'll just say this close. I, I looked up one factoid, which is he served as chairman, the actual post for only 287 days. Um, yet he was so revered. I mean, he, he, the hearing room, the main hearing room has now been named after him in the House of Representatives. Uh, at his funeral, you had multiple presidents and cabinet members talking about him. Uh, he even got a tribute and an ovation at a full crowd at Yankee Stadium. So obviously he made an impact beyond just being chair, which is Lying entire, in state. Yeah, career. So I think um, in thinking of his legacy in, in that hearing room, which is gonna be named after him, you're, it's it's in name, in spirit, and in his portrait, I think will be put in, I'm not sure what the current date is, but that wonderful new portrait will be hung. And I think members sitting there in the future will try to invoke him whenever they, you know, I think it's in their interest, of course, but whenever they're trying to show that they're being uplifting in the way that he was. And in that room, uh, dedication, Steny Hoyer said he hopes that future generations will come to see 
uh, and ask who that man was, and a person will turn around to them and say he was better than us. <laughs> I just and, want to thank you, thank uh, for uh, giving us this opportunity to talk about to talk about our friend. And and I really appreciate your personal stories because it brings uh, to life a figure that some may have only seen as a revered figure in Congress and not an actual man with vibrancy and, and love. So thank you. And thank you all for uh, joining us the, uh, today. And hopefully we will see you again at one of our next Levin Center webinars. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.